We're also joined today by Mark Lowe, founding partner of Third City. Uh, Third City um, is an agency that was um, co-founded by Mark back in 2011. And in that time, it's grown to 30 people um, specializing in issues, rich consumer and corporate campaigns with a focus on brand building and behavioral change. The agency has been shortlisted for more than 50 awards in the past two years alone. Um, campaigns include Outsmart Epidemics for Welcome Trust, Villages for Ancestry, Cold Turkeys, Bazaar, and Third City's strengths lie in its complex service sectors like fintech and healthcare, as well as government and not for profit work. Um, certainly, obviously, they've had a strong foundation um, to weather the storms of COVID. We have Oliver Foster um, from Pagefield. Pagefield is an independent communications consultancy specializing in integrated campaigning, public affairs, corporate crisis, and brand communications. Um, they don't take a one size fits all approach. Instead, they analyze and respond to every challenge individually. The first 10 years of their existence, I can't believe it's 10 years. Oh, that's gone quickly. Um, they yeah. work the biggest brands from Kellogg's to British Airways and some of the most exciting challenges from Airbnb to Starling Bank and some of the most UK's cherished, ins cherished institutions like Bart's Hospital to Her Majesty the Queen and the Diamond Jubilee celebrations. Oliver Foster is their chief executive. He's over 20 years experience across, political, um, across the political divide within the media and throughout the business and charitable sectors. As Pagefield's chief executive, he brings his insights from those relationships to advise and deliver for chairs, chief executives, and other senior business leaders across the full breadth of Pagefield's clients. Alex Greer is the fourth member of today's panel. Uh, he's managing partner of Frank. Uh, Frank is 20, good looking, straight talking, no nonsense, down to earth, say it as it is agency, not a bloke as it happens. Um, they are perhaps best known for being a creative PR agency and their starting points are ideas that earn attention and media. They believe that ideas should be worth talking about and coined and patented the phrase talkability. They have Frankers, as they call them, in London, Manchester and Sydney. And Alex has been uh, their managing partner since, uh, well, he's been with the agency now for 15 years and uh, he, he stepped up to managing partner, I believe, um, or joint managing partner some years ago now, but he's now running the ship all on his own, although he's surrounded by some fantastic Frankers. Um, over the last 15 years, the agency has grown from London-based boutique agency to one of the UK's leading and most awarded consumer PR agencies. Uh, Alex works closely with the Frank team. In the last 12 months, Frank has delivered award-winning campaigns for Burger King, Huawei, D-Day Story, and UN Patron of the Oceans. Um, and outside work, Alex spends most of his time taxiing his four children. Clearly, obviously, he's been in the danger zone uh, during lockdown. I suspect there's probably now six of them, isn't there? No, I'm stopping at four. Good for you. Okay, guys and girls, so that's our team. Um, as ever, if you have questions um, as we go into today's conversation, um, just want to check that we are on record. Uh, we are recording good. So we'll get going, really. Um, let's sort of talk a little bit about the kind of political environment we find ourselves in at the moment. I mean, there's been an, an awful lot going on in the last week. Uh, there's a huge amount of confusion. Uh, I think originally I, I entitled today's presentation Confused You Will Be. Um, but I mean, particularly if we look at what's happened this week alone with um, Boris and other members of his government uh, continuing to confuse people both at a national and local level as to what they should and could be doing. Um, what's going on with the, with the communications department at number 10? I'm going to throw this one straight at uh, our friends at Pagefield. Oliver, you must have some insight. What, what, what are they up to there? Yeah, thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. Um, uh, I, I'm going to try not to swear on, on this, uh, not least because it's recorded, but it is very easy as, a, as a, a, a kind of common professional, as we all are, to look at what's going on over there and, and, and uh, have no other words but swear words in our minds. However, what I would say is, and, and, and you, you mentioned the word confusion, Stephen, um, and um, it clearly has become confused. But um, in some respects, the communications failures that the government is currently going through is in, is in part as a result of the, the, the initial success they had at the beginning of all of this. Um, and for me, you know, everyone has different ways of looking at what, you know, what, what, what are the key criteria for, for good communications, whether it's political communications or otherwise. The message needs to be clear, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be compelling, not confusing. 
Um, and at the very beginning of this crisis, I think they ticked all three of those boxes very, very well. Now, differences of opinion, of course, about the, the way they went about it and some of their policy decisions, but from a communications point of view, they were incredibly successful with that first round in March and April of, 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 of the stay home, protect the NHS messaging. Uh, clearly, they have been too successful because trying to wean people off that initial communications has been a real challenge for them. Um, I mean, in terms of what's what's going on at number 10, um, uh, you probably hear this every under every government, number 10 really, really, really is in, in, is in control. I think that um, we're currently living under a more centralised uh, government operation than we have for many, many years. Um, and if we all look uh, sort of jealously um, at, at what's going on in, in Germany, as, as just one example, the setup in Germany is completely different to here. And I, I think this country, I'm in no way trying to make excuses for, for this government, quite the opposite, but I was thinking about this the other day, in many ways, this country is, is, is too big to be so centralized, but it's also too small to, to adopt the sort of federal approach that, that Germany has done. Um, and you know, in many ways, Angela Merkel's life is actually much easier than Boris Johnson because she's she, she's able to rely on uh, on the different federal states coming to different conclusions, but having a central uh, sort of coordinating role. This government, particularly, but because of the way the British state has has sort of evolved over the years, is incredibly centralised and far too centralised. And that's why I think the government is 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 causing itself so many difficulties, so many own goals. Um, uh, and and because within that structure, we also have some individuals in the form of Dominic Cummings and others who are by their very nature incredibly controlling and all powerful. It's making the situation that was already pretty bad before coming into this even worse. Um, and uh, I, I don't see an immediate way out of it because there's not going to be this sudden decentralization that happens in this country overnight. Um, because politics is so febrile in this country and always has been, and so combative, particularly between the two main parties, um, that that sort of lives and breathes at the local level. So if there were a London mayor right now who was a Tory, I suspect we'd be seeing a very different picture in London than what we have. Whereas we have a mayor who's con constantly complaining and coming up with no solutions, with a, a, a central central government that is trying to come up with solutions but making mistakes as, as they go along. And punters who live in, those of us who are still in London, um, are sort of suffering the brunt of that and are really confused about what's going on. Um, so, so as I say, number 10, if they followed their original approach way back in March and April and they were delivering a message that was clear, consistent and compelling, they would at the very least, even if some of the policies were wrong, they would at the very least gain some of our respect and, 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 and uh, the population's following of what those rules are supposed to be. And so when the Prime Minister himself can't yesterday uh, remember the detail of those rules, um, then you know you've got a problem. I mean, it's almost as if actually after Cummings Gate, that's when the wheels really came off. We, we, um, Savanto had been sort of tracking sentiment both amongst consumers and business owners and the popularity or otherwise of um, our uh, ministers. And there was a massive, obviously, dive after Cummings Gate. Um, and in all but it's, re it's reinforced the sense of British fair play, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I wonder, I mean, this is Kate and, uh, and Alex's question, uh, and indeed it, it marked too, please. If, the, if this was a brand, you know, and you were basically advising um, the, the brand owner what to do at this time, um, you know, where, where would you start? Well, I'm going to throw that one you, Alex. Off you go, then give Kate 30 sorry. seconds. I, well, I was going to say, I think that it, when I was listening to Ollie chat, I was going to say, actually, you know, for us, if we were giving advice to a brand the advice you tend to to give is keep it really simple be clear with who your audience is and pick one message uh, that you're going to give them and have one spokesperson for the brand generally um, and of course the the challenge that you have now is we're all at home consuming more media through more channels than we have done before there's more reporting and you have a constantly changing situation so it, I, I mean, I'm not surprised that, that people at home are uh, confused because you're hearing multiple messages from multiple different regions, from multiple different people uh, with a situation that changes every day. So by the time I finally caught up with what I, I am and am not supposed to be doing, 
it's changed again or I've been told something different by someone completely new. Um, so so it, it's a, a very difficult situation. So, Kate, I mean, reflecting on that, I'm thinking, you know, it, FMCG brands, you know, have also had to uh, adapt their messaging through this period and have had to come out um, with a you know, broad range of different communications. But one would imagine it's almost more time, consideration and thought goes into managing uh, a brand than it seems to be going into managing government communications at the moment. Yeah, well, I'd hope so in many respects. I think, as, as Alex and Ollie said, I think um, simplicity is absolutely key and we are constantly having to adapt. As everyone knows, the situation is changing constantly. The news agenda is changing constantly. So long-term strategies for brands and plans that go beyond a few weeks in the initial period were, were, were out of the question because the, the situation was changing so rapidly. But I think brands have really had to adapt their approach to comms. They can't be self-serving in any way and the brands that are, are coming out on top are the ones that are providing much more meaningful products and services um, during a difficult time um, and as Alex said the brands that know their audience is really well so pick one audience and understand them inside out and back to front because consumer behavior has changed so much since lockdown that brands need to be very cognizant of that and, and respond quickly. Thank you Kate. Mark? Um, I was just going to actually just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that, that um, Ollie said, which I thought were quite interesting. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to be overly critical of the government. And actually, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to be able to tell them what the solution is. But I think in terms of gut diagnosing the problem, the, the, the question of a federal state and whether a federal state communicates better, I think um, that that's um, problematic if you look at the performance of, say, Brazil and the US, which both federal states have performed incredibly badly, both in terms of communications, the way they've managed the crisis. So I think that's an interesting one to consider. And I think in terms of diagnosing the problem for this government, I think that their comfort zone is in what I would call campaigning communications. Um, and, you know, you've got the core of the Vote Leave campaign team basically running number 10 at the moment. And actually, government communications the practicalities and the um, difficulties, straight niceties of that are something that they're just not that comfortable with. And I think that's why you end up in a situation where they're constantly looking for new announcements and actually making promises that they can't keep. And that is, I think, the thing that has really uh, sort of damaged trust. I think that there is still a lot of, uh, a good level of goodwill towards the government, but I think that's been damaged by the fact that they're constantly looking for a new promise to make and actually then breaking those promises. So I think that's probably for me, the key rule that's been of communications that's been broken here. Yeah, and broken promises are at the heart of brands and building trust. Um, and I think one of the things I've noted, and this is obviously what's happening prior to COVID and sort of change gear for a second, if we may, um, was that you know, PR and communications and the role of PR and communications has expanded and broadened enormously in the last few years. I've seen it accelerate through this period and continue to accelerate. Um, you know, many years ago, um, you know, advertising agencies would look at what we used to term uh, below the line with some sort of healthy disdain. And the, and the reality is these days, um, you know, less money appears to be being spent on, on advertising directly than it is in other communication arts and, and sciences. Uh, including PR and communications. Why is that the case, do you think? I mean, is it a function of channels changing or is it actually to do with the power of earned media and, and believe about the believability of, of earned media? Should we start with, with Kate on that one, please? Um, yeah, I think it's, th there isn't one answer to that. I think it's a mix of things. Certainly what we've noticed as probably everyone in this, on this call was you know, budget, budgets being frozen, activities just being dropped the minute that the pandemic hit. Um, and as that started to come back, less money has been invested into above the line. Um, and as a result, more money um, from some clients has tended to come our way. So bizarrely, despite the situation, we found ourselves with existing clients being able to grow those quite significantly um, over the past six months. So winning new business from, from organic clients. Um, and I think the trust is there. I think Alex touched on it before that, you know, there's people are at home more than ever. Digital content has increased. People are constantly on their phones checking the news because the situation is changing constantly. So there is significant appetite to be in that um, media space by clients as well. 
Yeah, yeah, Kate, I mean, I think when it comes to social media, you know, there's a huge amount of distrust and, and concern around it, particularly obviously around fake news. And we've seen it in, in the elections in previous years, and obviously we're watching very closely in the US elections, how that's going to actually impact. Um, I mean, to, to, to what extent do you think that social is um, being undermined by fakery, um, Alex? Do you think it's something that actually, I mean, do you advise your clients uh, against using social or are you uh, very much a believer in it? No, I think we're, we're believers in social and, and to pick up on your, your previous question, actually, I think that move towards earned and earned creativity pre-COVID came about because a lot of brands realized that that kind of traditional marketing model whereby the only agencies capable of doing creative thinking were ad agencies, kind of in that, that traditional sense of an ad agency. Um, and actually with the move at the time, with the, the sort of big move towards social and digital platforms, um, there was a, a realization that actually you could get brilliant creative thinking perhaps more economically uh, from other agencies and those agencies could produce the work um, and the content, whatever it ended up looking like, um, at, at marginally less cost. So it sort of became a, a very economical way for, for brands to do exciting creative work and, and get it out there without having to do expensive production and expensive media buying. Um, but I think now, um, the, what, what's interesting on social um, is that there has been a overall kind of drop in trust on social, but I think that's more for news consumption. Um, so there's a, a report um, that I was reading, it was an Ofcom report, and I can't quite remember the stats, but it, it was something around the, you know, trust in social channels had dropped from 38% to 35%, something along those lines. Um, so I think for, for news reporting, Yes, it has dropped for brands that want to engage with consumers um, and existing fans and reach new ones. Um, social continues to be a, a brilliant um, media channel to use. So, I mean, if that's the case, then Oliver, it's, it's all your fault, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks for that, Stephen. Uh, I mean, I um, just on I've got several sort of responses to what's been said so far on on Twitter. Um, two or three years ago, I lived and breathed Twitter and got everything I wanted from Twitter. Where I, where I sit today, um, if, I were, if I were Donald Trump or Biden, whoever the next president is, I'd pull the plug on Twitter. It's vile. It brings huge benefits, of course, but it's absolutely vile. And there's, it's, it's a wild west and it's completely lost control. And for them to argue that it's the responsibility of people, their users, and they have no control over that is absolutely ludicrous. Um, now, obviously, I'm talking, uh, I'm talking, you know, rubbish because it's never going to happen. Uh, but I, it makes me so angry and disappointed. Uh, uh, um, uh, Twitter and indeed Facebook, the 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 the, the goal that those technology companies have to say that they that it's not their fault. It's absolutely their fault. They have created this this environment in which people feel free to abuse in some really disgusting and criminal ways. Um, so I've got that off my chest. In terms of the, in terms of the, um, the sort of wider space that we're operating in, I, I agree with all the points that were made around, around the, the around the, 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 the sort of shifts in in the way that um, uh, you know the, the the broader communications marketing environment is changing. I, I've certainly, to Kate's point, definitely through this we have. Um, continue to grow our existing client relationships and the, the new business, the, the, the huge amounts of new business that come our way, um, the, 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 the main change we felt from those have been a combination of very short term projects, but much higher levels of fee to take account of that. So much less certainty, but, but worth taking the risk because the fee is that much greater. Um, and out of those, we will know in six months' time whether you know all of those different projects we've taken on during COVID become long-term relationships. I'll obviously have every hope they will, but also realise that not all of them necessarily will. And in terms of the, the sort of um, the shift to um, you know not necessarily away from advertising, but I think that the transition, I've certainly noticed from from our perspective, and obviously we're in a slightly different space to to, to the other guys. We're, we're very very corporate and we're we're lobbying, but. 
Um, I think there has been a realization across boardrooms, um, uh, uh, you know, across this country, across the world, arguably, and not just the big, not just the big boys, but small companies and, you know, challengers like Starling Bank, who we work for, that everything from a communications point of view really does need to be integrated now. And we are working regularly with uh, with advertising and marketing agencies, with 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 or, or with the in-house teams with our clients in a way that we never did four or five years ago. And I think finally we might be at a point where comms in its in its most sort of general sense is absolutely represented around the board table um and and whether it's covid that people have realized that needs to happen or whether it's before whatever it is now really happening and it's really really good to see because it should have been happening all along um and the fast-paced nature of, of media in, in part twitter and facebook which i said i'd switch off um the, i think boardrooms have realized they can't afford to, to treat communications in, 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 as I say, in its, in its broadest sense as a, an afterthought when they've taken the board decision and then, then they go to the comms team. It's absolutely the comms guys are, in, are a part of that decision making. Yeah, it is interesting. You look at the board makeup of, say, the top 100, top 200 FTSE companies. You know, the corporate affairs director, uh, he or she has for many years been part of that board makeup or at least a senior member of the, the management team. Yet we still fight to see marketing directors on, on the boards of these organizations, very rare. Um, so I think it's always been held at a high regard, but I think what's happened is that social media has accelerated the need for these corporations to be more acutely aware of the requirements in that space. Um, Mark, I mean, we, we, we just touched just briefly there with, with Ollie about the fact that actually most PR firms, most con firms have done rather well during COVID, um, albeit obviously, as you rightly say, you know, there's a lot of short-term projects coming in. Um, and no real understanding as to whether those will continue in the longer term. But I, I know that you, you've done well in this period too, and, and I know that the agency continues to grow. Um, one of the things I have witnessed, and I'm getting lots of inquiries, um, mainly from M&A businesses at the moment, is there seems to be a, a move for comms agencies to broaden their offer, either through collaboration, which is what Ollie was just talking about, or actively looking to move into the digital marketing space and, and trying to advise clients in that space. Is that something you're aware of or something you're even considering? Yeah, I mean, I think we're talking there about, just to say, there's some very big questions that have just been discussed in the last 10 minutes, which probably would all warrant their own webinar. So I'm not going to try and tackle all of them. Um, I think the, the general trends uh, pre-COVID and over the last sort of four or five years, I think, has been a convergence between both PR and advertising and between PR, what are considered PR agencies and what are considered digital agencies. And I, and I think that the trend will move towards that becoming um, even less distinct, particularly the digital PR agency divide. Just talking briefly about the actual past six months, I think I get a general feeling from the trade press um, and from sort of Twitter and other places that possibly the PR industry is a bit more chipper than advertising. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that we've, I think you see less of what I would describe as a promotional public relations now, but that's been replaced by uh, corporate crisis and areas of consumer comms, which have really grown and become more important where you are influencing the behaviors or actions of organizations. And I would count that as what we term in, in PR, I suppose, consumer PR consumer issues. So uh, there's less, um, there's less broad brush, uh, uh, sort of earned media work, I suppose. There's less selling into the media than there was, uh, just because there's just not the space that there used to be. Um, digital has been of huge importance in the PR industry the last, particularly the last five years, uh, particularly the growth, I think, of paid social. Uh, that's a really integral part of every campaign we do now, both paid and organic social, and that's massively accelerated. Again, because of the question of share of voice in this period, the news agenda is so busy that you need to pay to get cut through on, on social channels too. So I think what we see now is really an acceleration of trends that were, were already there. And I'd expect to see more convergence stroke integration uh, in the future. Back to you, Alex, if I may, on, on, that, on that very point. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think on the convergence point, Mark's completely right. And I think I went to a, an industry talk pre-2010 where agencies started talking about convergence. And certainly 
for us in the consumer space, um, uh, I would say 70 to 80% of our clients, we would, for at least the last decade, tend to have been one of up to half a dozen agencies around the table looking at, at integrated comms. Um, I thought actually what, what Ollie was saying about that, that kind of having a, a comms person now at the board table, um, I think what we have seen in recent years and certainly seeing now over the last six months as well is the C-suite of businesses are recognising that they are responsible as faces of brands um, as much as the brand itself. Um, so, you know, th there are many boardroom names that regularly now get get quoted in what would previously have been termed as, as consumer media. Um, and it's sort of led to this, this word that I guess the industry, another made up word that we've all come up with, you know, but we, we've talked about corpsumer um, for a while. And it is that sort of coming together of, of corporate comms and consumer comms, which then to, I think it was Mark just mentioned it, you know, a, a lot of the work that brands have been doing, particularly over the last six months, is consumer issues you know consumer issues and certainly at the start of the pandemic a lot of brands just said we'll, we'll stop everything like we don't really know what to do or what to say um and it, there's some serious stuff going on out there we definitely don't want to say the wrong thing so let's stop entirely until we figure it out and then i think brands actually had to sort of choose between you had to be informative and helpful and then there came a point actually when we were a couple of months into lockdown and the new normal or whatever you want to call it had, had sort of set in um, perhaps with some of the boredom as well and the challenges of educating kids at home and everything else. And then actually there was a, an opportunity for brands then to start to be a little bit entertaining and fun too. Um, because at that, at, at that point that sort of became okay. And I think what now will be a really interesting challenge and I realize I'm waffling a little bit, but what will be a really interesting challenge going into Christmas is actually how brands should behave in the run-up to Christmas um, because historically Christmas has been the time for celebration, family get-togethers, you know, go out, spend big, you know, whether that's buying your Christmas lunch or buying Christmas gifts and all the rest of it. But in the world that we're currently in, we're actually, in my house, for example, rule of six means we can't have anyone over. We've got four kids, me and, and my wife, that's it. We're at six. Um, but actually what happens if, like, which set of grandparents do you get to invite around? Um, what happened to, you know, Uncle Bob? Like, does he still get to come to Christmas lunch? Um, and actually in a world where, you know, there's no more furlough scheme, there's real uncertainty around jobs and the economy, like, do I spend big to put a bad year behind us and time to, to treat the family and the kids for Christmas 2020? Or do I say, actually, I'm really not sure what, what the world looks like beyond I'm going to be a little bit more cautious and, and we're going to have actually like a, a relatively cheap Christmas? Okay, well, I'll hold that thought for a second, Alex. I think it's a really, really important point. And um, Kate, I mean, you, you work with lots of retailers, you work with lots of um, FMCG brands. What, what's the view they're taking? And what are their plans between now and Christmas? Because this, this is their peak period. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, as you can imagine, really, really turbulent. So we've got we've got some clients like Morrison's, for example, the grocery sector is is booming, um, booming in, in volume terms, but it's cost their businesses a lot of money as well in terms of making their environments COVID safe. And um, we represent brands like Cafe Nero, who furloughed ninety percent of their staff um, in March, who have, have really suffered and, and not caught up since then. Um, but, but the stance generally that they're taking is quite short termist. It's always been a very fast turnaround business, not too much long term planning. Um, Morrison's, for example, we are talking about Christmas at the moment. But to Alex's point, it's very hard to know where we're gonna, whether we're going to have a rule of six across the board right now or whether we're going to be in lockdown where households aren't able to mix. So anything they do do will be very sensitive to the situation and very, very last minute. Um, and value is going to be one of the key messages because a lot of people are in financial difficulty coming out of furlough schemes and um i don't i don't expect people to have a really lavish christmas necessarily to put to put the bad year behind them certainly from morrison's point of view it's all about keeping things simple and value and, and no john lewis tv campaign i understand this christmas no <laughs> probably, probably got other things to spend their money on at the moment as well 
Absolutely. So survival, obviously, is, is very high on their agenda, too, I imagine. OK, well, I mean, let's just let's talk about um, one other aspect of, of PR and communications and, and what, what has changed. And, and that is the kind of the role of influencers. Um, like them or hate them, they're not really going away. And, and to what extent, I guess, you engage with that audience when you're actually putting together a plan for your uh, clients? Well, can I can I start with you in, in terms of influences and, and, and whether or not you see a role for them for your client base, and if so, how you engage with them? Yeah, I mean, what, I think what uh, people have known, I think, about for, for quite some time about the role of influences in consumer comms and brand promotion and, and things like that, and obviously there are issues in in and around that, around the questions of payment, transparency, uh, and things like that. I think one interesting area is the growth of the importance of opinion formers in corporate PR um, on, on digital channels. Um, Ollie, I'm sure will be able to talk a bit more about this, but um, you know, I think we do a lot of uh, campaigns which are looking to shift, say, elite opinion, uh, opinion formers, expert opinion, um, and actually rather than speaking to people face to face using digital channels, um, LinkedIn, for instance, has really come on in the last couple of years in terms of how you can use it as a tool to target to target opinion formers. Um, the question of payment still there in both in both areas, clearly in consumer comms, the it, you know it's becoming almost as big as advertising itself. Uh, the the question of sort of using influencers and that throws up some interesting um, sort of areas. And I think you can see from the growth of the number of influencer digital platforms, I may get targeted by, targeted by about five every day, a new influencer platform online. You can see that clearly people view this as being a gap in the market and potentially a huge growth market as well. Um, whether we want to hand over the intermediation of, in, of information to individuals is a bigger and more vexed ethical question, I think. Um, but again, it probably deserves its own webinar. Yeah, well, then we'll have to come back to that. We'll get a bunch of influencer agencies on a future, a future show, as it were. But yeah, Ollie, I mean, on that point, in, in your space, I mean, you, you've got dozens of influencers, you, you call them journalists. I mean, what, 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 how do you go about um, tapping into the, the, you know, the, the consumer side and actually finding other people who can basically politicize or get involved in some of the subjects you deal with? Yeah, it, 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 Mark's absolutely right. It, it's, I suppose it's, it would be rare for us in our, in our line of work to engage with the sort of your classic Instagram influencers for the work that we do, not, not, not entirely uh, unheard of but 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 rare you know if, if there were uh, say for example we were working for FMCG brand in uh, I know uh, products that were high in sugar and salt and fat and so there was a, a, a lobby around um, you know impact on on kids then we might engage a, a sort of your, your classic Instagram influencer but most of our most of our work most of our campaigning um, uh, does involve influencers at the more at the more corporate end so it's very rare for us to take forward a a, a, a sort of um, fully fledged lobbying campaign without engaging those kind of people Stephen as you were just mentioning the the commentators the columnists so not your traditional 24 7 journalists who are filing copy every day but the the more established names who uh, have a big uh, following in the in, in the papers they write for but also a big social media following they're quite often talking heads on uh, on news channels um, and are, are just, you know, not necessarily completely household names, but household names in the households that matter, i.e. those in and around Westminster and, and other decision making parts of, 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 of the sort of the UK's infrastructure. So, so yes, 100 um, percent. You may not you may not think that, that those sorts of people are, are your classic influencers, but they absolutely are. They're, they're opinion formers and, and they have. Um, they have generally very good tentacles within the corridors of power mm. uh, by dint of what they write, but also by dint of their relationships. So it's a, it's I guess the transaction is different, isn't it? You're not necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily paying for that. You're basically no. the reasons why they might be doing that. No, exactly. And don't, don't forget, we are, we are a regulated industry lobbyists, we, and, and, and rightly so. So, you know, any, any money that is transacted, it, it absolutely needs to be declared through the registers. So, um, the, uh, the the way that we go about um, engaging influencers in our world is, is is not by signing a check; it's by persuading them of the, of the argument. Where checks are signed, 
this is not a murky sort of environment, but, but it totally above board is with think tanks. You know, those relationships are totally declared, but there is an exchange of, of money of some form between client and think tank to commission a piece of work. Think tank is independent, but is, you know, you go to a certain think tank if you think they're likely to, 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 to sort of see the world in a similar way to you. And there's a multitude of think tanks that have grown over the years from, from left to right and somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Alex, I mean, this time last year, um, you were um, conducting and, and winning numerous awards for your um, Chinese client, your Chinese telco client, how are we? Um, yeah, years gone by. It's been by the government. Um, in a situation like that, where you've got a consumer brand that's conflicted with political um, ambitions around the world, uh, what, what's the role for a consumer agency in that space? Because, you know, they still need to continue to sell and promote their products. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's been a, an interesting one. Um, and again, I'm sure there's a, a separate session in its own right <laughs> uh, where we could probably talk about that, uh, Adam, for night and back. I, I did want to pick up, there were a couple of thoughts, actually, I just wanted to throw in on the influence piece, if that's all right. Of course. It's, that particularly from a, a consumer brand perspective, um, the role of, of influencers has been massive over the last couple of years. Um, and I suppose largely that's looking at them, whether you're looking at them as a media channel or as an ambassador. Um, and what has been really useful in, in more recent years has actually been some of the tools that have come through that help you identify the right influencers for the right audience for the right client and actually then look at their genuine level of influence, i.e. how many real followers do they have versus fake. And also, I suppose, from a client perspective, as clients have become better educated and more experienced at working with influencers, understanding the importance of engagement versus just an overall reach figure. Um, and then, of course, payment transparency, absolutely. Um, but I think, you know, if you then think about some of the more niche areas of, of an industry or growing uh, categories, then working with influencers can actually be hugely beneficial. So uh, I, a personal example, like I, I'm relatively new to CrossFit, but following the sport and following a number of CrossFitters, um, they become a, a brilliant channel to follow a sport that over here doesn't get a huge amount of media coverage. Um, and actually seeing them use brands and products in their everyday training that they genuinely use because it helps them to train and become better at their sport has then ended up in me also making some purchases, which I will openly admit haven't made me any better at CrossFit. Um, but um, but a, a good example perhaps of get the targeting right, work with the right person, reach the right audience with someone who's very credible then results in sale for the brand. Yeah, and I guess it's a similar cake for many years. You put, you know, personalities, high profile celebrities in, into your communications and at the heart of your communications. And obviously you're tapping into their followings and their popularities. Um, the question I have though is how are you kind of, you know, if it was straightforward media, you go to someone like Brian here who's on the call or one of our media agencies and it'll be a straightforward conversion. You work out what the coverage is and, the, and who they target and who their audience is and you'd be able to work out and correlate what you should be paying these people. But it doesn't seem to kind of follow that pattern. It seems to be much more um, down to persuasion and negotiation rather than a sort of a, a fixed rate or a tariff card. Yeah, exactly that. And I think when every time I get a brief from a client, it's about really establishing what they want to get out of it. Um, I think what we have noticed more and more is ROI is critical. So as Ollie mentioned, comms has got a seat at the boardroom table finally, but it means more questions are being asked about what, what is coming back in return. So yeah, the pay, paying ambassadors, it's not as simple as a rate card. Um, and there's been some steering away from that. I think there's, there's rarely a plan that we put forward that doesn't have influencers included in it. Um, but probably influencers um, as ambassadors, kind of that, that mid tier of, of micro influencers who can genuinely engage consumers um, and drive behavior change or what, it's what clients are looking for. Um, and, and again, they're a digital channel where we can measure consumer behavior. We can measure swipe ups like Alex buying his CrossFit products. Um, but they're, they're the areas of comms that clients are really interested in and they can put a tangible value on them. But, but big tickets for, for, for celebrities, um, 
that there's there's naturally some nervousness or shying away from that area at the moment from some of our clients. Okay. I'm going to open it up now to, to questions from all of um, the, the guys and girls in today's call. Um, and whilst they kind of think about some of their questions and what, what they would, who they'd like to ask them of, um, I have just one general question to, to all four of you, and that is that you're all operating from home today, or, or so it would appear. Um, I know, Kate, your agency and Alex, your agency in the past, and I'm not sure, Mark, whether um, your agency has been nominated, I'm pretty confident it must have been, for your culture. Um, I mean, if I look, Kate, into your business in particular, you know, 25 years now, 27 years, I think now you, you guys have been going, and at the heart of what you're about is a very, very strong culture. How are you coping um, at the moment? How are you basically continuing to promote that culture? And, and what tips have you got for both agency owners on this call and people more widely? Well, bizarrely, I can see our agency owner, Caroline, is actually on, on this call, so she'll, she might have a few as well. Um, but, but yeah, we are, we're really proud of the culture um, and we fared surprisingly well during COVID. There was initial real concerns about not having everyone together. I think as a creative industry, in-person collaboration has always been really critical part of the job um, and we obviously haven't had that um, but we are regularly in touch with staff um, we're an employee-owned trust so I'm not sure whether people are, are aware of that but 60% of our business is in trust for our employees so everybody has a say and also a real vested interest in the business so there, there is a real commitment I would say and motivation from the team to kind of pull together particularly during difficult times and get through that um, but we have um, a big emphasis on mental health um, awareness in the office at the moment, as you can imagine, that's a big, that's a hot topic and one that's not going away. We put a considerable amount, amount of focus into there and we have a dedicated team of staff who look after the well-being of the team. So we often get deliveries on our doorsteps and the doorbells ringing when we're at our desks at home um, and treats and, and pick-me-ups. Um, we had a well-being week last week with lots of sessions, sports sessions, financial sessions sleep sessions for the team so you know everyone's grafting very very hard but um we're trying to make it um make sure we make a real point of people being able to have a bit of time out as well and um, we're working much more flexibly and i think everybody is so there's obviously no prerequisites to be in the office at the moment um but i think the flexibility will continue and people are really appreciating being able to take a bit more control over their working day um, and they're just trusted to get the job done and, and they've proven um to be absolutely fantastic and very gritty and determined during a really difficult time. That's some brilliant, brilliant tips there. I mean, I, on a personal level, I've been overwhelmed by the number of gifts and cakes that have arrived at uh, 34 Kingswick Drive since I've been um, here in March. But um, I know, Alex, you, you, you describe your agency now as a, as a club um, and it's kind of optional as to how you know, club members use the facility. Yeah, so we, I mean, we were, uh, as everyone else was, we were working from home for however many weeks it was. And then uh, late late July, very early August, when the messaging started to become, you know, okay, now go back to work if, if, if you can. <laughs> we opened the office, and we, we, but we called it a members club. We said there's a, absolutely don't need to come in, but if you want to come in for an hour... If you want to come in for a day or don't come in at all, it's entirely up to you. Um, and uh, on a personal level, um, I found it great to have a, a change of scenery. I also found as someone running a business or trying to run a business in these times, um, sitting at my desk in the office made me feel like I was behind the, the steering wheel again, rather than trying to drive from the passenger seat where it was sort of just about doable, but a bit fiddly and it didn't all quite go as it was supposed to. Um, so definitely that, that kind of change of scenery and, and that maybe that's also because I'm, I'm old and I've been knocking around the industry for 20 years and I got used to, to coming into an office for 20 years. It was quite nice to be back at my desk, um, creature of habit and all that. But there's, there's you know, as, um, as the circle team, you know, we, we've done the pub quizzes, we've done the group yoga, we've done meditation sessions, tea and coffee chats, the fun stuff, the more serious bits, you know, we signed up to an employee assistance program because we recognize that um, it's definitely not an easy time at the moment. And actually that was, and continues to be, I think one of the biggest challenges, you know, we, we are an agency of, we're an agency of young people. Um, so most people here are mid to late twenties. Um, and, I think from a, a mental health perspective, some people were, were really quite upset when they were told, okay, now work from home again. 
um, because actually for them, you know, whether it was one day a week, two days a week, um, coming out and being in the office and getting a, a bit of company from, you know, their mates, because we've got lots of people here who are, are great pals, um, was, was a really good thing. So it, it, is, um, it is tough. We've had, I mean, just last week we had the, um, the heads of the Advertising Association, the PRCA, um, BPIF and, 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 ver and various others uh, and DMA on the call. And all of them had a different interpretation over the guidance as to whether or not you can work from home or not. Insofar as a lot of agencies are just carrying on, giving people the opportunities to come in for the very reasons you've just stated. Others actually had take the, taken the decision to withdraw and go back into, into their homes. Ollie, it must be really tough for you guys because I know your, your way of um, promoting agency culture is, is to have a party, um, you know, on a regular basis. And so, so, some of the, you know, you even have your own agency signature cocktail. Uh, as well as um, the famous fag area outside the, uh, the office there. That must be really hard, I mean, for, for all of you at the moment. Yeah, well, we've all learned to make Negronis at home, obviously, which, which has helped to get us through. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, Stephen, I was, so, I was so sad last week when the rules, or was it week four, when the rules changed for, for exactly the reasons that Alex and, and, and Kate were alluding to. Uh, and, and frankly, we're not defying them, but we are absolutely working within them and saying to people that, that the bar of entry to come to the office is, is effectively, if, if you're just not happy at home for whatever reason doing your work, that's going to have an impact on us as an agency. So, uh, so apply to, to, have, to have a space um, to, to work. So we're, we've introduced a, a very, very, very flexible system uh, whereby we have a, an upper limit and the week before people applied for a, a space and it's so far it's working we're, we're not being oversubscribed but everybody who wants to go in there for whatever personal reason they're able to do that and if an inspector comes knocking and and, and bollocks us so be it uh, because our, our our people's well-being is far more important than than a rule that doesn't really make much sense um so but before then we were really excited so similar to alex we op we reopen on first september as opposed to earlier in august and uh, essentially without calling it a club membership, although I quite like that, I might steal it. Um, that's effectively what we've introduced. And the only, um, the only compulsion on the guys uh, as part of that club membership was they had to be in for, on a Tuesday at lunchtime because we would all sit around and Stephen, you see in our office, we'd sit around the, the now very large communal area in a sort of come by our fashion, eating our lunch and having a, having a kind of very informal team meeting for, for an hour and a half. And it was lovely. Uh, and they all loved it. And so as soon as this news broke, and it was obvious we were going to have to stop that, which we have now stopped, uh, it was really heart-wrenching. And also, frankly, because um, we were doing our small bit for Soho when we were coming back on a Tuesday. We were getting lunch from a local uh, cafe, and you know, guy, gu guys were going out and having catch-up coffees. You know, every small little bit, keeping some of those places alive. And now they're likely to be decimated as a result of this, uh, result of this change. Um, more widely, though, during COVID and, and to, to sort of get us ready for that very flexible approach that we're now going to be um, taking forward, whatever happens, we've you know, paid for, given everyone a budget to pay for their working from home environments to try and make it you know, a, as good as it possibly can be uh, without paying for their interior design uh, refit, but, but giving them a decent work from home setup. Um, We've set up a new buddying scheme uh, in addition to the sort of mentoring and in addition to the line management. So there's a whole host of, of possibilities that the guys have. Um, we already have a, a weekly team meeting, but we're, we're doing that now, at the very least weekly, if not bi-weekly. Um, we've been giving them even more transparency over the figures um, than we normally would. We're always very transparent, but we've probably given them even more um, in, in recent months and that will continue just to give them, you know, as, as, as honest a view as possible um, because, uh, as, as Kate was saying, uh, whilst we don't have the, the, the sort of same structure in terms of employee ownership, um, we are a, a, a people business and um, they have, I mean, many of them are very young. And when this first hit um, was, as all of us on this call, it was a, it was a real shocker, but for, particularly for the younger ones who hadn't experienced 2008, it was, it was the first time they really had something like that happen. So uh, for me, transparency was best. And in, in, in those early months, it was, um, it, you know, it, it, made it made it even more scary for them. But yeah. actually the upside of that is they're now seeing the, the fruits of their labor 
Um, and I, I think they've hopefully learned some skills along the way around how you manage a business and, and, and what, you know, what the differences make to the bottom line. So, um, so yeah, a, a, apart from last week and the change in, in, change in the rules, um, everybody's in a really good place and a, a really loving that club uh, flexibility, um, which we've introduced. Mark, I want to come to you now, but it's a slightly different question. Thank you very much, Ollie, on that, because um, there's some ace and great ideas from the three of you there and things that one can do. Um, the, the cold reality is, that as we come to the end of the support schemes, at the end of October, and as we move into what I'm calling um, Bloody Sunday, November the 1st, despite the changes that were announced this week, I don't see anything in that package um, that's really going to help to support the creative industries and make it any less likely that we're going to have to uh, lose some talent, um, not necessarily in your agencies, but across the industry more widely. Um, is your view, um, Mark, that, um, that that's rather inevitable? And, and if so, as agency owners, what obligation do you think we have to the people who we work with in terms of creating opportunities for them to retrain um, and get back into work? Wow, well, okay, yeah, big question. Um, so I suppose I can comment uh, sort of with respect to the the PR industry. I think that's probably what I'm what I'm closest to. I think certainly we're looking at a period of disruption, similar to I think. Well, 2008 was quite disruptive for agencies, but I actually think 2010, when all government comms was pulled, was actually potentially even more of a shake-up period for the PR industry. And I, I think we're seeing something similar now. A lot of senior talent going to the market. We're seeing new agencies launching all the time. I think one of the strengths of PR, one of its, um, as usual, your strength is often your weakness as well, is um, there are fewer barriers to entry sometimes than there are in other disciplines, which means that it is quite easy. Um, and also with the fact that also there's also no expectation of office overheads, I think, or less of an expectation from clients as well. The entry points to starting agencies are much are much easier. I think, when we, but that that can be, problematic because I think that's a bit of an oversupply problem it's something that I've talked about um, before it's sort of in other scenarios um, certainly so that that's going to create more competition I think the upsides are as I say there are some really strong growth areas um, I think the industry's uh, very positive about you know where it can go and what we're doing and I think you know those opportunities particularly in things like corporate comms the growth of digital platforms um, are going to be positive. And I think from our point of view, you know, we were lucky enough to be in a situation where we've actually been busier than ever. Um, there was a crisis period in March. Uh, there was some retrenchment, but actually then clients coming back and realizing that in fact, they even perhaps need to spend more rather than less than they did. Um, and I would hope and expect that to continue. But also, as Ollie alluded to earlier, I think Alex and Kate have too, you know, the, the, um, the future is opaque. It's difficult to see what will happen. And clearly, we do have a responsibility to all of our staff, um, hopefully to um, keep them developing with our, within our own environments. And I think the good thing is, certainly with agencies like Frank Pagefield and Circle and us, I, I hope as well, that we've got very sustainable business models, strong culture, um, and being an independent or um, sort of uh, 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 at least having ownership control over the agency gives you the ability to decide your, your future and, um, better. Sorry, that was a little vague, but I hope that helps. No, it that does help. That does help. Listen, um, we're, we're coming to the end of the today's session. I just wanted to thank all of our participants and all of our panel for, for um, your time today. Some really interesting topics, and as you rightly say, stuff that we probably could actually do whole sessions on. I want to say a couple of things. Um, in terms of getting together, we have a, a, a new concept called networking. For those that are interested in joining us on Friday, we've got our next networking session starts at 11 o'clock. It's in Windsor Great Park, and then we're all going to end up in a pub in COVID-friendly environments with tables of six. Um, if you're able to join us, then please contact David after this call. Um, other thing I'll draw to your attention, we talk about mental health issues, and, and the fact is it's going to get worse before it gets better, I guess, as we move into the next six months. Um, I would uh, draw your attention, I barely do this, to a PRCA uh, talk on Friday, uh, um, which will be delivered by Alistair Campbell, no less, talking about his own mental health journey. Um, if you'd like to uh, go to that event, um, it was on our weekly um, update. Um, if you want to know how to get onto it, just go onto the PRC website or contact um, myself and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. 
Next Wednesday, we have Joza Mosca, who is the Vice President and Managing Director of Celebrity Cruises. She, she manages the Celebrity Cruise brand right across EMEA. She is a force of nature, a powerful woman running a very difficult business in turbulent times. Um, really could not be, I think, a more difficult business I can imagine at the moment than running a cruise line. Uh, she's coming to talk to us about a number of things, including leadership, uh, what they've done and what they continue to do for their customers. So I think that'll be quite an interesting debate. Uh, we haven't finally decided whether we're going to link her up with somebody else to, to, uh, on that session, um, but I'll, I'll let you know by the uh, end of uh, this week. Um, thank you once again for joining us and uh, have a great rest of the week um, and, and keep doing good stuff. Cheers. Thanks, Stephen. Stephen, thanks all. Cheers, guys. Thank you.